So the area that we're standing in now, which is on the Sequoia National Monument, it's 100% mortality, overstory mortality. There is no living foliage on any of these trees at all. This must be what hell feels like when your whole world is burning. Can't go outside, can't breathe, and then the places that you love are burning. To see trees that have lived to be that age and that size should not die in a wildfire. That's not what they've evolved to do. That's not what they're adapted to. And so seeing something that just is so abnormal is hard, I think, for me to get my mind wrapped around. Somebody's got to tell this story, you know, because the sequoias are not going to speak for themselves. What makes a sequoia? It's, it, it just is. It's like that gestalt. Like it's like when when I was asking my dad if a ponderosa pine was a sequoia, and he was like, "No, you'll know it when you see it." And it really is. Like when you see a sequoia, you're like, "Oh, yeah, that's what everyone's talking about." These trees are sometimes called the guardians. You know, and you think back back in that time, yeah, they were but in the environment that they live in now, they are no longer the guardians, they're the victim. I am Linnea Hardland and I work for Save the Redwoods League as the Giant Sequoia Forest Fellow. I'm also attending graduate school at UC Berkeley in Scott Stevens' lab and I am working on Giant Sequoia Castle Fire study for my master's research with Alexis Bernal. My name is Alexis Bernal and I am a research assistant at the University of California Berkeley Stevens' lab. This summer, looking at the effects of the Castle Fire on giant sequoia mortality. What's well, Azzy? 204. Okay, so one of these. In the fall of 2020, um, around this time last year, we had a fire run through this area called the Castle Fire, which burned through many of the giant sequoia groves. It started as a lightning strike in a pretty remote area, kind of over by the Kern River Canyon. Under certain weather conditions, it um, kind of grew pretty rapidly and started burning through sequoia groves. This year, it was our plan to come in after the wildfire and do some post-fire monitoring. So trying to get an assessment of not just what the overall tree mortality was in the fire footprint, but specifically looking at how the old growth giant sequoia fared during the wildfire. This is one of our high severity plots. As you can see, it's 100% mortality in the overstory, including a lot of the large sequoia that are around us. And we're here kind of remonumenting the plot to make sure that when we come back next year, we know that we're remeasuring in the same place that we measured this year so that we can track that change over time more consistently. We're also trying to look at management history, so trying to get an assessment of what the forest structure and composition looked like prior to the fire and whether or not that had an influence in the subsequent fire effects. That way we can at least provide land managers with some sort of idea of ways at which they can treat their forest um, so that hopefully they can conserve these species in the future given that wildfire and climate change are obviously going to be an issue going forward either directly by the way that we've managed our forest or indirectly by the way we've affected our climate. Um, this, is, this is on us, we, we did this. People say, well, this is just the nature sorting itself out. No, humans have, have induced this problem. Sequoias are so highly fire adapted. You know, they require fire, the radiant heat of fire to open their cones. 
and drop their seed, and then they require bare mineral soil for their cones to germinate. But yeah, so when it dries out, like these spaces will open up and the seeds will fall out. And so we know that they experience low to moderate severity fire pretty frequently, both from the scars, but also just the fact that they have a really high height to live crown, which is that like part of the stem or the bowl of the tree that's bare before you get to the live crown. And so they don't often have a lot of live foliage that's close to the ground that would be able to catch on fire or allow fire to move up um, into the crown and their thick bark um, and the fact that they require not direct heat but radiant heat to open their cones is really indicative of that low to moderate severity fire. After over a hundred years of fire exclusion and aggressive fire suppression, through other things like grazing, through over exploitative logging practices, we've created these conditions that are really unhealthy for the forest. Right? We have higher tree densities, so these smaller sized trees that provide vertical continuity between the surface fire and the crown, the tree canopy. Um, and so that fire comes up, travels up these ladder fuels, gets into the crown, as we have seen even into the crowns of these sequoias, which historically, right, would resist that kind of fire because they're so high. And then that fire is allowed to take off and propagate through that canopy much more easily than it would have. There was a recent report put out by Nate Stevenson and Christy Bing from the National Park Service at Sequoia Kings Canyon, where they estimated based on aerial Landsat um, imagery, and they estimated about 10 to 14 percent of the world's giant sequoia population was lost in, in the Castle Fire, fire alone. Sometimes when I stand here in front of them, that's when I, it kind of like washes over me. Like, wow, this tree has been here through all of these historic events um, that have happened in the last 1,200 years, all of these weather events that have lasted and happened in, during the last 1,200 years, and it still survived. But now, suddenly, they're no longer surviving. You know, really in the blink of an eye on the time scale of, of the life of a giant sequoia, um, it's gone. I really don't know how to describe that feeling, um, except for that it's just devastating. to take a hard look at the groves that have been impacted by the Castle Fire because mm -hmm. while it is depressing to see the things that have happened and they shouldn't have happened, right now we have an opportunity to set these forests on a different trajectory than they're already heading. That's what I want people to understand is we might have extreme topography, we might have extreme weather, but at the end of the day, there is no fire without fuels. So why aren't we manipulating the fuels to help prevent these sorts of things from happening? You look at these trees that are left here and you can kind of see that this was a very dense forest, a forest that needed fire just based on the size of the trees underneath the canopy of the monarch. I cannot stress how urgent it is to really take action now because Climate change is not gonna wait for us to catch up. And our forests are already in such a compromised condition that they need a lot of work. And so if we don't take action now, I honestly think that this, the consequence of that would be one of really humanity's biggest failures. Yeah. I just hope that as Californians, we can be really proud of the fact that we saved this species, that we become a state that's proud of a really robust 
uh, prescribed burning program of a responsible, ecologically minded um, forestry program here. Mm. Look at this one. <laughs> Look um, at how big it is. <laughs> like compared to that one, you know? Yeah, it's gotta be about so impressive. ten centimeters tall? Yeah. And this one's just one year old, and so is that. <laughs> Most people walking by wouldn't even know that this is a giant sequoia despite its size. Um, it is still a giant sequoia, you know, it came from mm -hmm this seedling, or this, this seed, mm -hmm. tiny little seed grows up to be one of the largest trees on earth. These seedlings came from trees that died in the fire. And so if this cohort doesn't survive, then um, there will be no more sequoia in this part of this grove. So this is essentially potentially the last generation of giant sequoia that will exist here, unfortunately. So I hope that it succeeds. That's why we're coming back here and collecting this data to track seedlings like this over time and see how well they're doing. But again, that's kind of a very long-term process to determine that, right? We're gonna have to wait hundreds, if not thousands of years to see if this ever becomes a monarch. Um, and it very well may or may not, so. It's definitely not gonna be in our lifetimes. Yeah, it's not. But it, it's something that we can, you know, we'll work towards in our lifetimes. Yeah, yeah, we'll work the rest of our lives on this, really, and keep moving this work forward and really investing um, a lot of time and resources into uh, protecting this, protecting this seedling. Yeah.